Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Inspired by You. I am your host, Debbie Turner Bell. I am a member of the HDVCH uh, Foundation Board and so glad to have you with us. We want to thank you so much for joining us for this impact chat where we will be chatting live with clinicians and leaders behind the innovative advancements made possible by the generosity of you, our donors. Today's topic is the NICU and family-centered care, and we're joined today by Dr. Mitchell DeYoung. Dr. DeYoung is a neonatologist with HDVCH, and we also have Jane Fannin, a clinical registered nurse and the coordinator of our NICU parent-to-parent -parent program. And we're so pleased to have joining us Jenny Justice. I just like her name. <laughs> uh, and she's with us, who is a graduate of our parent-to-parent -parent program. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Welcome to all of you. So let's get started. I'm going to start with you, Dr. DeYoung. Will you just give us an overview of the, uh, the NICU program and uh, the infants that you treat? Sure. Well, I've been very fortunate to be at um, DeVos since the year 2000. Um, we, ever since and well, long before 2000, our sort of goal of taking care of um, babies was to give babies the highest level of care as well as their families. Um, we're very fortunate to have what's called a level four nursery, which is, um, means that we have the highest level of technology as well as the availability of subspecialists um, 24 hours a day to treat preterm babies and full-term babies that have special illness. Um, we're one of only one of four, um, excuse me, one of three level four nurseries in the state and the only one in the west side of Michigan. Um, we are actually the largest NICU in the state of Michigan and certainly one of the top 10 in the, in the U.S. Um, because of our level four status and the fact that we're as big as we are, we take a very, um, um, have a big responsibility to treat other babies throughout the state. And so for that reason, we do a tremendous number of transports, anywhere between about uh, 1,200 to 1,300 transports a year. Wow. Those are either done by fixed wing or by helicopter or by ambulance. Um, just so you're all aware, our transport um, teams are dedicated nurse practitioners, uh, respiratory therapists, and nurses that uh, provide high-level care, NICU-type care, even in our ambulance. Um, and importantly, our ambulance is actually donor-funded, and so that's a really important part of our program. I want to take this moment and be sure and mention that if you have any questions for our guests, be sure and put those in the chat and we'll be able to answer some of your questions in the chat later on. So as you're thinking of them, put those in. So let's go back and talk a little bit more. I understand, uh, Dr. Dion, that you have dedicated space for babies that are significantly preterm. Tell us about that. Sure. So very imaginatively titled as our small baby unit. There you go. So it's a, a NICU actually within a NICU. It's dedicated to babies that are born under 27 weeks and just sort of so everyone knows what that means a term pregnancy is 40 weeks so these are babies that are really over three months early um, this is a space that is um, as I mentioned a separate space within our NICU and it's staffed by specific nurses and respiratory therapists um, that have special training and taking care of babies that are born this early um, as you can imagine, babies who are born this early have really specific developmental needs and um, specific needs to help all of their organs develop as normally as possibly. We coordinate all of our care in the SBU as well as in the NICU with um, subspecialists that will really try to ensure the, the best outcome possible for our babies. Mm. Tell us a little bit about how philanthropy has helped these programs. Sure. So we've been very fortunate at DeVos um, to have a tremendous um, involvement of, of um, people who want to donate to the NICU, and that has really tremendously impacted our programs. The first um, example that comes to mind, uh, we have cameras that are um, available remotely to, to, so that parents, grandparents, friends um, who are given the access codes, obviously, by the parents, they can see their babies remotely. Mm -hmm can only imagine what an impact that had um, during COVID this, these last 18 months where um, visitors were, were um, restricted from the hospital. And in fact, even grandparents couldn't come in and see their, their own grandbabies. Um, additional philanthropy has helped with um, what is known as the Whole Genome Project, which um, very simply allows us to 
um, evaluate baby's entire genetic code um, very, very quickly so that if there's a question about diagnosis or a question about therapy, we can get that answer within just a couple of days, whereas um, frequently we were waiting for several weeks to months before we could make a decision on therapy or decide on doing different tests for a diagnosis. Um, we've also been very fortunate to have um, donations to help with our music therapy program. Um, it sounds very simple, and in fact it is, but babies clearly respond to music, and instead of using um, more pain medication or trying to give babies um, medication to help them sleep, oftentimes we can have music therapists that will come in and actually just, it's amazing to watch them um, be able to calm babies down just with, just with singing to them or playing guitar or um, uh, other forms of music therapy. Wow. And then importantly, um, just like any other medication, breast milk is really considered extremely important for um, preterm babies, in particular extremely preterm babies in our SBU. And um, we've been very fortunate to have uh, um, philanthropy help out with giving um, breastfeeding mothers meal trays during the day so that they don't have to worry about going to get something to eat down in the cafeteria or having to go to McDonald's to get something to eat and so that they can stay right in the room and, and provide breast milk. Um, and then I think really what we'd really like to talk about today is our parent-to-parent -parent program, and Jane will be able to talk about that. Yes, Jane, tell us more. Thank you. Parent-to-parent um, -parent is called so because all of our volunteers were formerly NICU parents. They all had babies in our unit. And then it's a mentorship from one parent to another parent. Um, the program initiated actually in 1973 when the unit opened, the idea for the program was born and in 1974 our first match actually happened between a parent and a volunteer. Initially these were done geographically and today we actually um, try to match up with parents with what their wants and needs are so whether it's a gestational age which is how early their babies are born or a diagnosis or if it's just totally a separate need or want from that family. So myself as an RN and Linda she's a social worker we um, collaborate together with the, to run the program. We're both coordinators. I bring in the medical aspect. She brings in the psych -soch, and together it just makes that program work very well t together. In the past, they've done some research and it shows that having this mentorship program, it helps decrease anxiety for families. It helps decrease depression, increase interaction with their babies and bonding and then just gives those families extra confidence in taking care of their babies and having, being in the unit. Um, COVID, as Mitch mentioned, um, has brought in a bunch more stressors to our families. They were unable to have their support system at their bedside, but we've been lucky enough that our volunteers, even though they couldn't come into our unit, we were able to continue running that program and they could reach out by phone calls, by text messaging. If they wanted, they could do a virtual meeting with this family. Mm -hmm. So it was, we were probably the one of the only units in the hospital continuing to use our volunteers throughout this time. So that was pretty amazing. Um, our volunteers have three main roles that they do with us, the one-to-one -one matching. So that can happen anywhere from the beginning of the stay till actually the babies are going home and parents are like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. So we, again, we match them up and to whatever that parent wants, and then it can continue after discharge. So whereas the family loses us as their medical team and support, they can reach out to that volunteer at any point after discharge and say, what worked for you? How do I, how do I handle this situation? So that mentorship does not end with that discharge, which is awesome. They also bring in dinners. So dinners pre-COVID, um, we'd have like two or three families that would plan a meal and bring it in once or twice a month. That would happen and it would happen at the same time our child life specialists were doing their super sibs program. So siblings could go and have pizza and an activity with the child life and our parents could come and have a home cooked meal and sit down, learn, um, from our volunteers their stories they can share their stories it was more of a social hour they would meet other families in the unit it was a huge success and then um 
the visiting parents. So one of our volunteers would come in, usually in the evening, sometimes during the day, but they would just round on the unit. And if a family was at bedside and not busy, they would just introduce themselves, share a story, find out if they needed anything, um, and just have like a conversation and just be a, a support right there at the bedside. And another very unique role that our volunteers do is they actually talk to our new nurses. So it's another great experience for them. So the new nurses during their orientation have an opportunity to hear what it's like to have a baby in the neonatal unit and then um, ask these parents any questions they want without any fear. It's like, what is it like to have a new nurse for your, you know? And so it, it's pretty amazing some of the questions the new nurses come up with to ask our families. So that's pretty awesome. But um, again, research has shown that mentorship really helps our families in our unit. We wouldn't have this program if it was, wasn't for the generosity of our donors. Such a wonderful so, program. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, go ahead. You were just So, yeah, so Jenny's here, and she understands better than anybody what it's like to be a parent in the neonatal unit, and then to have that volunteer help her, and then she is now one of our volunteers and reaches out and helps our families. So we're very happy to have her. Tell us about your experience. Sure. Um, well, it was actually um, practically almost exactly eight years ago where we kicked off this journey and it really begins when um, I was pregnant. It was about 20 weeks. I was 20 weeks pregnant and went in for our ultrasound and we um, discovered we were expecting twins. So it was a, a huge shock already, um, but it was shortly thereafter that we were sent over to a maternal fetal medicine doctor. And around 27 weeks, she became really concerned because one baby was bigger than the other. And what was, um, what was happening was, in my case, I was having mono dye twins. So there was um, basically one placenta, two amniotic sacs. And um, when that happens, um, the twins are virtually sharing nutrients. And in our case, um, what can happen sometimes too is that they can develop what's called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. And that's when one twin is getting more nutrients than the other. And it's dangerous for both twins because A, one twin is getting fewer nutrients, but also the other twin is getting too many nutrients and it's harder on their system and their organs and whatnot. So, um, so our, my doctor explained this to me and she said she would be very surprised if I made it to 30 weeks of my pregnancy and a, a, a normal pregnancy is usually 40 weeks. And this just blew my mind. I, I had never heard of, you know, this, you know, naively, had never heard of such a thing, babies being born so early and surviving. And so I asked her, you know, what would be the complications and what are the risks involved? And she just rattled off a ton of things, you know, brain bleeds, heart problems, respiratory issues, just a whole host of things. And I was terrified. And so um, we went home and she, she called us back. She wanted us to come back two weeks later for another ultrasound to see if there was any change or progress. And so we had an ultrasound, there was still no growth. So she sent us immediately to um, labor and delivery and we had an emergency C-section. Our twins were born, um, one twin was born at 2.7 pounds. Um, the other one was born at 1.13 pounds. Very, very tiny, very, very sick, very little, 12, 13 uh, inches long each. And they were immediately whisked off to the NICU. Um, and um, that kind of kicked off our journey, our NICU journey, and it was overwhelming. We were, um, we were very scared, we were very anxious. Um, we didn't know what their future looked like, what our future looked like. We had two um, healthy baby boys prior to this. You know, what, what did we just do to their future? So we were really, really scared. And, we were, and on top of that, um, we had no knowledge of the NICU and we were being taught, thrown all these medical terms, and, you know, CPAP and blood transfusions and, um, all kinds of things, and um, you know, it's just overwhelming. And so, at some point, um, someone came to us and asked us, you know, asked me, "Would you like to be matched with someone who has gone through this before?" So I said yes, and I met this woman, Ashley, and she had had twin boys almost two years um, before we had ours, and they were 29 weekers, just like ours. And she came by to the hospital. We met. She met our twins, and she kind of, mm -hmm, you know, it was all very familiar with, to her. And um, a little later on, she invited us, uh, she invited me um, to coffee and she had her twin boys there with her. And they were two years old and they were just perfect. They were beautiful. They were running around. They're getting into trouble. They're doing all these things that little two-year-old boys should be doing. 
And I just remember um, that, you know, just how much hope that gave me for our future and how comforting that was. And it really helped um, go through the rest of the, you know, the, our NICU journey. And, um, you know, our twins spent approximately 120 days there in the NICU. Um, but this year, um, in just a few days, they're going to turn eight. And um, they're thriving, they're healthy, they're, um, they're just uh, amazing. And we just credit, my husband and I credit the, the doctors and the nurses and the social workers, the technicians, everybody. It's just, and the parent to parent program for um, just helping us really get, get through this, the, the whole entire journey and the whole entire process. What a journey it is, and you now volunteer, right? Yeah. For the yes, parents. yeah, and, yeah. And, and my hope is that I can provide that sort of source of hope and comfort to other parents that are going through the same thing. Can you, uh, we're gonna move into a time of questions, but since you're talking, Jenny, I just wanna ask you right away, can, can you imagine what difference having the parent-to-parent -parent program made for this, what could only be expected to be a difficult journey? Uh, for these little babies, what difference do you think it made? It, it made a huge difference. You know, I, it, it's you know, it's um, a, a, I got to see you know what the future looks like. You know, I couldn't even imagine a life outside of the NICU when we were there, and um, and just that source of comfort, um, friendship. And, you know, I developed this friendship with us um, with Ashley, and um, um, it just um, made all the difference in the world. And what you know, what questions to ask? You know, because we we didn't even know where to start. You know, what, what questions to ask, and so it was. It was, um, it's a tremendous program. Um, we're, I was, I'm very grateful that we, that it was there for us. And I'm just, I'm, I look at these beautiful faces here. <laughs> you got gorgeous boys <laughs> and they're, they, um, just look perfect. As they you are. Said. Yeah. I know you're so grateful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. So let's talk about, uh, some of, uh, do a little bit of follow up with the programs and some of the things that you do. Uh, Mitch, you mentioned a couple of times that, uh, we are level four that, our NICU is a level four NICU. What exactly does that mean? So designation is made by the American Academy of Pediatrics and to a lesser extent, the state of Michigan. Um, level one is what you would classify as just a regular term newborn nursery. So very healthy term babies that are just kept there while mom's recovering from delivery, they go home. And then that works up from level one to level two, level three. And then level four, as I mentioned, there's only three um, designated level four nurseries in the state of Michigan. And what that means essentially is that we have all subspecialists, all um, technology available to take care of really any type of baby that's born. So whether those kids are born extremely early um, and have just medical conditions, or if those babies are born with surgical conditions, um, heart disease, congenital heart disease, any baby that can be taken care of in our hospital. You know, I'm just, I'm going to go off script just a little bit because I'm amazed at what technology has allowed us to do in terms of sustaining the life of preterm babies and how young, uh, gestationally, that we really do have a chance to, can you just, I don't know if it's quantify or, or just describe uh, what you're able to do today uh, with a preterm baby that wouldn't have been imagined even 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. Sure, well, um, I, I started my residency in pediatrics in um, back in 1989. And at that time, sort of the limit of gestational age where we could, could um, successfully take care of a baby was about 27 to 28 weeks. So again, term pregnancy, 40 weeks, that's about three months early. Um, those are now babies that routinely, any, any baby younger than that is admitted to the, our small baby unit. So our limit of viability at this stage today is 22 weeks. Wow. 22 is, is very much of a gray area and there's lots of discussions that take place with the medical providers and the parents um, about sort of what will happen to their babies and decisions that n need to be made. 23 weeks um, is, is where what we consider we expect those babies to survive at this stage. Um, clearly it's a really, really long road, um, but we have lots of, of um, success stories for babies born at 23 weeks. I'm just amazed by that, it's so amazing. So is the NICU involved in, actively involved in research and education? We are, so we have um, pediatric residents that are in our nursery all the time. So as they're rotating through their pediatric residency, 
they have to do a NICU rotation. So we have um, residents that are actively involved and we're doing teaching of neonatology to them. Um, you can't get better unless you continue to learn. So we um, actively involve ourselves with education, continuing medical education, obviously, but we clearly um, have education with the nursing staff. Um, the nursing staff educates us as medical providers every day about things that they're learning um, as well. So um, we, we value education and we know how important it is. Um, we do, do um, actively involve ourselves in research as well, whether it's a drug company trying to figure out whether or not a different medication works or not. So we are actively involved with um, sponsored, industry sponsored studies, but we also just have um, individual studies going on within our nursery as well, which are um, among the neonatologists, they are what are called the private or um, primary investigators. Mm. So you really are on the cutting edge in that in that regard. Yeah. Jane, let me come back over to you. I would imagine um, that some parents, probably uh, one of the difficult parts of the journey is these little preterm babies, they're tiny already, and then they've got tubes and you know all kinds of things hooked up to them. I would imagine that parents might wonder, a mother particularly, can I breastfeed? Yeah. my baby in the so, NICU. Yes, we 100% support breastfeeding in the in the neonatal unit. Um, oral feedings, which is either, which is by mouth, begins usually right around 34 weeks. We um, actually have a scoring system where we have to score a baby for a couple days to make sure they're ready to start those oral feedings because starting too early can be detrimental later. Mm -hmm. So, um, prior to 34 weeks, they are fed through a feeding tube, but we prefer to actually start with breastfeeding if a mom wants to before bottle feeding, actually. Mm -hmm. And we put those babies to breast once they start cueing and telling us that they're ready to as soon as possible. So um, we do a lot of skin to skin with moms prior to that and dads, but um, Supporting that, we let the babies nuzzle at the breast, but we encourage parents to breastfeed at the bedside. We encourage parents to pump at the bedside, but research has shown that breast milk is best for those babies. So if we can get that started early on, it's huge impact on what happens later. Yeah, indeed. So. And again, with, with all of the machinery and what's necessary to sustain these preterm babies, are parents able to stay overnight with their baby? Yes. So we... If a parent would like to spend the night, that is 100% okay. Um, we have both open bay nurseries and private rooms. The private rooms, of course, are gonna be a little bit easier for a parent to sleep at the bedside. It's a little, they have a little bit more room, but even in our open bay nurseries, they are more than welcome to spend the night. Um, we try to just scoot them off to the side just a little bit so we can still continue our care. But um, if it gives them peace of mind to be there at that baby's bedside and they can sleep better knowing they're there, then 100% we encourage that. Yeah, that's it's whatever it. is gonna give them the less stress to be there or to be able to go home and sleep in their own bed. That's so good to know. Jenny, coming back to you, what recommendations would you give to a parent who perhaps suspects or knows that their baby is going to be preterm and what they have coming before them? What's What's your best tips? <laughs> um, well, you know, in our case, we had no idea. <laughs> but um, so my advice, if you're, you know, if you're having multiples or you, there are some complications, just um, do all the research you possibly can. Ask for a tour of the NICU. Get to know it a little bit. Check out what resources are available. Um, ask questions of people who maybe you know that have had um, preterm babies or had multiples and what their experiences w was like. Just do all the, um, the pre-work that you possibly can and um, learn from stories like mine where, um, you know, it was just, we, we, we had no clue, <laughs> so. <laughs> the parent-to-parent -parent program certainly helps with yeah. that. We can match, we can also, if they if somebody is interested, we could do a match even prior to delivery. That, ah. that we've done in the past also through that, the maternal. That's wonderful. I, I don't know why anyone wouldn't take you up on that, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Let me come back to you, Mitch. Are there uh, pediatric specialists available 24 hours in the NICU? And tell us a little bit about what you have available for. Sure, so it, that's part of level four accreditation. Um, any subspecialist that would be needed for uh, a, any condition that you can ever 
imagine in a baby, um, we have available at HDVCH. Um, everyone's available 24 hours a day. Uh, so if a baby's born with either an expected or unexpected problem, um, we can page or call the subspecialist. They will come in and um, do whatever is necessary to make sure that the baby does well. Talk to us a little bit about follow-up care, because I would imagine, and Jenny probably can attest to this, getting out of the hospital is just probably the first step for a preterm baby. Yeah, it really is. And as neonatologists, we um, sort of have our practice exclusively in the hospital. Um, however, when we know a baby is going home, we arrange follow-up um, for any of the subspecialists that have seen the baby during, during the hospitalization. We always make a point of um, calling the primary care physician to make sure that um, they are aware of that the baby is going home and what type of follow-up they would need just as um, for regular medical care. Um, and then we have a discharge coordinator or care manager um, who will set up all of the outpatient appointments so that when parents are getting ready to go home on that first day, um, they don't have to get on the phone and try to call all of these practices, which, um, as everyone knows, that can be really, really time consuming and, and um, frustrating sometimes, uh -huh. too. So that's all taken care of um, um, for the parent by our care manager. Uh, on a lighter note, Mitch, I wanted to ask you, I, t I took note earlier in your very first remarks that some of the things that you do for the babies to improve outcomes is playing music for them. And I'm just curious, what uh, genre of music do <laughs> preterm babies, I mean, do they like punk rock? Yeah. Do they like rap? I think pop? a lot of it depends on the on the music therapist. I mean, I think one of our music therapists really likes folk music, so I hear that quite often. Another one is some 80s covers that I'll hear her playing as well. So, so it's, it's up to the music therapist. Right, yeah. exactly. Okay. I didn't know there'd been a correlation between outcomes and what kind of music you play. Uh, for them. Um, before we let you go, um, both for you, Mitch, and for you, Jane, um, cast a little vision. Um, donors are watching, and, and of course, we're always looking for ways to improve outcomes, provide the best service and care um, for the region and nationally because of the level uh, that the NICU is. What do, you, what do you see on the horizon? What do you hope is the next step for what you're able to do for preterm babies and their families? Go first <laughs> you may go. Okay. Well, as we mentioned, we, we really did really rely on our donors for, for programs that are sort of over and above the, the just the everyday taking care of the baby. Um, you know, we can give medication, we can give, we can do ventilation, we can do surgeries. Those are sort of the basic things, but really what makes our nursery special and what makes our outcome special are the things that are over and above, such as music therapy, where we can reduce medications. We can, if parents are unable to be at the bedside, we can calm babies with, with music without um, having to give them um, medications, as I mentioned. We um, have parent-to-parent -parent programs that, that make parents better advocates, which again, as Jane has mentioned, has been shown without a doubt to improve overall outcome. So my hope is, is that with um, ongoing philanthropy, we can continue to have these extra programs, which are, should not be considered extra, but, but they have to be in this type of, of um, financial environment. Yeah, wonderful. Anything you want to add to that, Jane? Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, if we could create the most stress-free environment possible for these families, it would be amazing. I mean, like he said, our child life specialist they help with containment, which reduces stress. The music therapist that come through, our, our parent-to-parent -parent volunteers, anything that can help our families with better outcomes is pretty amazing. Wonderful, and thank you for fielding a question that kind of came out of left field. You did <laughs> great with that. I want to say thank you to all of you, Mitch and Jane, of course. Thank you for what you do and who you are. And Jenny, thank you so much for coming and to share such a powerful story. Really appreciate that, and congratulations on those beautiful boys. They're adorable. They're, they're wonderful. Um, that's uh, going to wrap it up for us today. But before we go, we want to uh, remind you or just make you aware of uh, how you can donate to the Parent to Parent program. That's at give.spectrumhealth.org slash NICU, N-I-C-U. So be sure and do that if you're so inclined. Also, I want to be sure to encourage you to mark your calendars for our next impact chat. Impact chat. It's going to be on July 15th at 9 a.m. And so mark your calendars there. And our 
our uh, topic will be advancing the battle against lung cancer with precision technology. So thank you so much to you, our donors, who um, make all of this possible with your generosity and your heart uh, and uh, for making this kind of transformative care possible. Hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.